I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Molly Murphy. She is the plant pono specialist for Big Island Invasive Species Committee and really um, handling plant pono for the entire state of Hawaii because it is fairly big program. She's lived in Hawaii for more than two decades. She has a degree in environmental studies from UH Hilo. Uh, she has worked in forests across Hawaii and the Pacific, identifying species and assessing vegetation. Since 2015, she's been with BISC, and in that, in that role, she's been working with nurseries and communities to prevent the spread of invasive plants and pests. She creates the contact content for plantpono.org, which we will hear a lot about today, I'm sure. And that's a website that's available to all and it's free and can help any resident in Hawaii make a wise planting choice for their backyard. She is very interested in the history and movement of plants by humans. And basically to sum it up, Molly, all she does is look at plants, think about plants, talk <laughs> about plants, sometimes some other gossipy items you know, like what's, go what's going on in the news, but mostly plants. So I will turn it over to Molly so she can do her most favorite thing for the next 45 minutes or so and talk about plants. Thank you, Franny. And I'll try to make this as exciting as possible. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, your travel guide down the road of good intentions. Again, my name is Molly Murphy and I'm the plant pono specialist for the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. Well, here we are in Hawaii, the most isolated place on the entire planet. We are surrounded by more than 2000 miles of Pacific Ocean on all sides of us. You cannot get any more isolated than we are here. But if you came 80 million years ago, this is what you would see, just ocean. Hawaii didn't exist. But then lava boiled out of the hot spot to make our island chain. So we went from ocean to molten lava to black lava or dry lava to one of the most botanically diverse places on the entire planet. Well, how did all the plants and animals get here? One of three ways, um, wind, wings, or waves. Um, by far, most of our native species arrived here via birds, either stuck on their feathers, in their gullet, on their muddy feet. Um, Wind, we had four species that arrived on wind, and it's three native orchids and the ohia tree arrived on the wind. And if you look at the seeds of ohia, they look like little boomerangs, perfect for flying in the wind. So anything that arrived one of these ways without the help of humans is a native species. And then we can break down native species into two different categories. Indigenous, which means native to Hawaii, but also native to other areas. So, Holly. Okay, I, we have lost Molly completely. And I was getting very excited there about that. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. I'm gonna show folks this website that uh, Molly will spend some time talking about today. Hopefully everybody can see that. Plantpono.org, so very straightforward, uh, easy to find. And uh, this is a way that you can check out any plant and find a background check. So one of the things that uh, plantpono.org does is a plant assessment. So using the Hawaii Weed Risk Assessment, which is a tool that was developed by a number of uh, botanists uh, in Hawaii, people who had, and across the Pacific, because this also applies in a, in a lot of Pacific islands, um, really looking at what plants are likely to be invasive and what kind of characteristics plants have that uh, make them more likely to become really bad invaders. So um, this has a, uh, 
score, plants get a score, and it, it's sort of cumulative in that in, if you have more things that can make you invasive, there's just more chance you can be invasive, but really the scores just put the plants in various categories. So below a certain number, that plant is really unlikely to become an invasive plant. It's probably going to play nice with all the other plants, and wherever you plant it, it's going to be cool. Um, once you get above a certain number, it's almost guaranteed that that plant is likely to be invasive um, in sort of a lower range. You have this evaluate. Those are plants that have some invasive characteristics, but maybe not many, or they have other things that conflict. And those invasive characteristics can look like a lot of things. So it could be something that um, you know, grows like a vine, viney things. You may have noticed, especially because we're talking specifically about Puna today, you may have noticed that viney things tend to be more invasive than other plants. Um, things that grow in the shade. So shade tolerant plants are more likely to become invasive. Things that produce lots and lots of seed, things that produce early. All of these are characteristics that could lead to a plant being considered invasive or more likely to become invasive. Then there's also the situation of things that um, are found invasive elsewhere. So if it's found in a climate zone that is similar to a climate zone we have on the island, which we have a lot of climate zones on our island, if it's found in an area that has uh, similar rainfall patterns, you know, similar kind of substrates, then it's more likely to become invasive here. So that's what the background check is all about with the Hawaii Pacific weed risk assessment. Um, and it's pretty accurate. It's a pretty good tool. Uh, we know that most plants that we have here are not invasive. They are things that are considered to be introduced because they were brought by humans if it's a non-native plant, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to cause harm to the environment, the economy, or to our health. So what this, this background check really does is try to find those, uh, pieces. Um, if you have something that you're wondering about and you're thinking, hey, I'm going to find this, and you're thinking, hey, is this a bad plant? One of the things you can do with the Plant Pono website is you can actually search the name. So let's see. Oh, I know. One of our biggest. Okay. I made it, Franny. Sorry. Oh, bad. I was just leading our patient audience through using the website. So I got a little bit of a head start there for you. I was like, why is Kavehi calling me? I'm giving a presentation. <laughs> I'm glad to know. I was kind of worried that maybe a power pole got knocked out by the construction work next door or something. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh no. All right, I'm so glad you're back and I'm gonna Thank stop you. sharing. And uh, I am going to... You can pick up the presentation where you were kind of, you. I was taking people real deep into plantpono.org, but you... Okay. You had us bit way out here looking at Hawaii in the scope of uh, all of how all of our natural resources developed. So we'll get people back into that and I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Just pulling it up. Let's see. Sure. Anyways. So after millions of years of isolation, the first people arrived in Hawaii, and that was the Polynesians. And with them, they brought plants, our first non-native plants, that are so special, we call them either canoe plants or Polynesian introductions. All of these species, um, they evolved in Polynesia in areas much like Hawaii. So once they got here, they you know, stayed in cultivation. They didn't run amok. Um, all of these, like I said, are found throughout Polynesia. They were, were incredibly crucial for the survival of the Polynesians. And today they're very, very special in, um, for the Hawaiians. So each one had a myriad of uses, like the tea plants. Um, it's a superstore in one plant. You could do disposable plates, food wrapping for hot and cold food, roofing, sandals, skirts, medicinal protection, spiritual protection. Um, you could eat the roots for famine food. We use it for boundary delineation. Um, it's a very, very versatile plant. And it's the same thing with coconut, which is kind of like the Swiss army knife of plants. You know, from the fronds, we could get thatching, mats, walls, hats, toys, so many different things from their fronds. 
And of course, the coconut is um, the water is life sustaining and full of nutrition. And then the coconut itself, the tree growing on the ocean helps prevent um, erosion. And then there's hala. So hala is a native species, but it's also a Polynesian introduction. And when the Polynesians came to Hawaii, the sails on their canoe were made out of finely woven lauhala. So I just talked about the first non-native plants um, and you know they're very, very special, but there's a lot of different ways to say non-native. Alien, exotic, non-indigenous, foreign, non-invasive, introduced. Just because it's not native to Hawaii does not mean it's bad. I mean, where would Hawaii be without papaya, plumeria, anthurium, lychee, and pineapple? These plants are all woven into the fabric of our society. They're ubiquitous. We see them very, very commonly. So after 1500 years of sustainable agroforestry with the Hawaiians, then the Europeans arrived. And with them, they brought ungulates like goats and pigs. And these were by far one of the most destructive things to happen in Hawaii. So I don't know if I, my webinar might have ended when my internet crashed, but when the native plants were evolving, they lost their defenses. So it was just, you know, easy, easy for these animals to eat the native plants. And they ate them down to nubs and the plants weren't able to regenerate. So we became known as the crossroads of the Pacific. And during that time, whaling was a huge industry. Um, back before electricity, whale oil was the best thing you could burn in your house because it burns clean and bright and slow. It didn't make soot all over the walls. So lots of whalers stopped in Hawaii. Well, in 1822, a ship called the Wellington stopped in Lahaina Harbor and they had these caskets of stale water that they went and dumped out. Well, sadly, those caskets of water had mosquito larvae and they dumped them in a place where it became a standing pool for the mosquito to start reproducing. Hawaii did not have mosquitoes back then. And then a few years later, there were more mosquito introductions and these ones were even worse because they had avian pox and avian malaria, two diseases which our native birds had no immunity toward. Within decades, we were already seeing extinctions of native birds. And that's why it's pretty rare to see a native bird, um, you know, down by the ocean or in the lowlands because they really can't survive where the mosquitoes are. And as global warming happens and the land heats up more and more, the mosquito line goes up farther up the mountain, which shrinks the bird's habitat. So then um, during the whaling time, Hawaii went through a rapid change. Um, over harvesting of sandalwood and unmanaged grazing of cattle. There were forests where you couldn't walk through. They were impenetrable because there were so many different plants. And the ranchers just let the cattle graze in these beautiful native forests. And when within five years, they were opened up and not clear, but you could walk through easily. Um, and yeah, that was pretty bad. And it was so bad because of this rapid deforestation and cattle ranching, water was coming down the mountain in sheets, um, sheets of muddy brown water. This is not a water main break. break. This is St. Louis College in about 1905. And this was a common occurrence in Honolulu back in the early 1900s massive flooding of muddy water all the time because the forests were degraded. Um, it was so bad that our first territorial forest, Ralph Hosmer, said in Hawaii, the most valuable product of the forest is water rather than wood. So that means keep the forest intact and stop harvesting all the wood. So, I took this picture just a few years ago. This is a native forest in Laupahoehoe, and this is what's perfect for capturing rainwater 
recharging the aquifer and keeping our topsoil intact. We've got layers and layers of trees, Ohia and the overstory. Then we have Olapa and Conavao. And underneath all of that are tree ferns and a deep layer of leaf litter. This is what we need to capture rainwater. Well, sadly, back in the 1900s, um, the people, I guess, kind of in charge of this, they didn't think native species could grow fast enough or would be effective enough to capture the water and keep the lowlands dry and, you know, recharge the rivers. So they raced around the world trying to find a solution. And that solution was Albizia. Joseph Rock, one of Hawaii's greatest botanists, imported Albizia from the Moluccan Islands in 1917. Um, he wrote in his diary that he didn't think it would be long lived and its only redeeming quality was that it self-seeded. And boy, did it self-seed. So it was planted in 1917, already naturalized by 1930. That is incredibly fast. If you look at Europe, it takes 150 years for a woody species to naturalize. In Australia, it's 125. Here in Hawaii, it takes an average of 16 years for a tree species to naturalize. And naturalize means that it made seeds that um, got away from the parent plant without the help of humans. And then those keiki grow to produce more fertile offspring. Well, Joseph Rock was so wrong because he thought they wouldn't be long lived. Well, those same trees that he planted in 1917 were cut down 100 years later and it cost $900,000. Very, very costly. So invasive species, it is a federally defined term, which means it's not native to the area under consideration and it could cause harm to our environment, economy or human health. So harm to our environment. Here we have a Vivi forest. It's one monotypic stand. You know it's full of um, fruit flies in, in muddy wallows because when you only have one shallow root layer, the water just sits on top. It doesn't seep down into the aquifer. And that makes um, perfect habitat for mosquito. Um, plus the, the Vivi are out competing and crowding out the native plants. And then we have this native bird that's being attacked by invasive ants on the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, Hawaii has no native ants. And if we lose this bird to invasive ants, I mean, how is that gonna change or upset the ecosystem? Threats to biodiversity. This was a study done in the early 2000s and it looked at what the greatest threats to native biodiversity was. On the mainland, it was habitat loss by far. In fact, most places list habitat loss as their main reason for biodiversity decline. But here in Hawaii, it is native species, I'm sorry, invasive species by far are what is threatening our, our native and threatened plants. Since the year 2000, Hawaii has lost over 20 endemic species. They are extinct, they're gone forever. Harm to the economy. I'm sure most people will remember Hurricane Isel. So this is actually hitting somebody in the pocketbook personally. Their car got demolished by Albizia and Cecopria. Um, I know a person during Hurricane Izel who had this beautiful big lifted Dodge truck and she bought it in the mid nineties. Great condition, great miles, but she stopped getting insurance on it, full insurance because it was paid off and it was getting old. Well, a tree fell on her truck and then it was demolished. So this is ways that invasive species can hurt your personal economy. And then harm to health and way of life. I'm sure we all know about rat lungworm disease. It's changed the way we live here in Puna. Um, I don't know anybody that will drink out of their catchment tank anymore, no matter how often they clean their roof or what kind of filters they have. Because these slugs can climb, the semi-slug can climb up your catchment tank and get into the water. 
they climb up walls. Um, they were introduced in about 2006, and that's when the rat lungworm disease got really, really bad in Pune. And then um, we have this poor dog with these cloudy eyes. This is a very common occurrence here on the east side of Hawaii. And it's because the animals are going through the bushes and the little fire ants fall on their eyes and sting them. And the poor dogs and cats, they can't wipe them out of their eyes. Um, I'm very careful now when I pick flowers to put in my ear. Like I've picked them and just put them in my ear and there's fire ants on them. And then they fall down my shirt and bite me. So now when I pick a flower, I shake it off and you know make sure there's no fire ants. So it's you know change the way we all live and go about our daily business. So invasive plants, um, they outcompete and crowd out native plants. This is banana polka um, smothering a koa tree in Hakalau. They don't percolate water into the aquifer. This is Himalayan ginger. Um, some people call it Kahili ginger, but um, it's not a native plant and it's very destructive. So we're trying to um, help educate people to not call it Kahili anymore because it's confusing and people might think it's native. It has these rhizomes that form a root mat on the ground. It's kind of like putting a rubber mat on the ground. When it rains, it cannot percolate into the soil. And instead the water pools and you know doesn't recharge our aquifer. Um, they can be allelopathic, which means they put out chemicals that stops um, or prohibits um, other plants from growing. They change the ecosystems to suit their needs, like albizia pumps nitrogen into the soil, which changes the whole soil chemistry. And often they have amazing <laughs> dispersal mechanisms. This is rubber vine. Um, if you can see the fruit right here, it's got this two-sided fruit and it will open and kind of explode. And all of these little seeds with parachutes will explode out and fly away. And they don't trap and hold in soil. This is Kaho'olawe and there was a big rain event, um, not enough vegetation to keep in the, the topsoil. So instead, it came down the mountain and dumped on the coral reef to, you know, smother it in some respects. So from the mountain to the ocean, invasive species affect us negatively. And they have the advantage because they have no predators. They're quick to reach reproductive maturity. They produce many offspring. Sometimes they have dormant yet viable seeds and they form monotypic stands. So myconia has no predators. It reaches reproductive maturity in about two years. It makes three to nine million seeds a year that are bird dispersed. Um, the seeds can last dormant yet viable in the soil for 20 years. And yeah, it forms monotypic stands, which makes like an umbrella under the water, over the watershed. But can we blame Joseph Rock for importing Albizia? He actually imported Myconia as well. We can't blame him because he didn't have the tools today, which I think Franny told you about, the Hawaii Pacific Weed Risk Assessment. Um, it is a, kind of a questionnaire for plants. So it's objective, which is really important because that takes the bias out of, you know, assessing a plant. Like you might think it's really pretty or useful, but if it's really invasive, you have to like take the bias out of it. Um, it's science-based, it's repeatable. So if I do a plant assessment and then you do one also, we will come up with the same conclusion. It's transparent. So each question is answered using published information and the references are listed for each question. And it's reliable. It's more than 90% reliable in predicting if a plant will be invasive. So it's 49 questions. And if it's um, the question means it could be weedy, it'll be more of a positive number. If it's unlikely to be weedy, it'll be a, a, a negative or lower number. So it's a categorical score. It doesn't really matter what the actual number is. So if it's seven or above, that means it's high risk. And that just means it could be invasive. It's got weedy characteristics. 
If it's one or below, that means it's low risk of becoming invasive. Um, and then there's this gray area, one to six, which means evaluate further. So with that, it's just, we're gonna keep our eye on it and, and watch it, we don't know. And a lot of times when it's evaluate further, it's because um, there's not enough published information to answer the questions. And that's how Hawaii is in some respects. Um, plants or animals or insects could be well-behaved in other places. So there's no documentation of you know, them being invasive. But then they come to Hawaii and they escape cultivation and run amok. Take Albizia, for example. It is the fastest growing tree in the world, but only here in Hawaii. If you grow it in Florida or California or Australia, it's not gonna grow 15 feet a year. Um, the Queensland longhorn beetle, it arrived here, what, 10, over 10 years ago and established. There is no record of it being invasive anywhere, but it gets to Hawaii with all of our different climate types and it becomes um, invasive. So it looks at the question categories are domestication and cultivation. So if a plant is domesticated over many generations, oftentimes the weedy characteristics are bred out of it. Like mustard greens, that's a pretty invasive plant, but humans selectively bred it over many, many generations. And now we have kale, broccoli, cauliflower. That's a result of domestication. Um, it looks at, can this plant thrive in a tropical climate? Is it a weed elsewhere? Oftentimes, if it's a weed elsewhere, that's the greatest predictor if it'll be weedy here in Hawaii. What undesirable traits does it have? And that's like thorns, allergens, things like that. How does it reproduce? When does it reach reproductive maturity? How does it disperse? And then how long does it persist? So I'll use Clydemia as an example. This is definitely uh, an invasive plant. It's one of the higher scoring um, high risk plants. Um, it is not domesticated or cultivated because nobody in their right mind would grow this vile plant. Um, it definitely thrives in tropical climates. Um, weed elsewhere. So I call it Clydemia, but the common name is Coster's Curse. And that name comes from a smear campaign between two neighbors. So there were these two neighbors that were co um, coffee growers and they got into a fight about something. And at the same time, Coster's curse was coming up. Clydemia was coming up and it was very bothersome to everyone. So the one neighbor accused Coster of bringing it in. And so from now on, we call it Coster's curse. So this plant has a long history of being regarded as a weed. Um, undesirable traits, you know what? That's the one thing Clydemia doesn't have. It doesn't have thorns, spines, poisons. Um, it reproduces within two years and it makes 10 million seeds a year. Each seed is about the size of a grain of black sand. You know, it's small, but you can see it and feel it. If you line those seeds up, end to end, you get a 3.5 mile long chain. Dispersal mechanisms, we know it's bird dispersed and persistence attributes. So the seeds can last more than five years in the soil. And if you cut it, just more is gonna grow back. It'll grow more branches. So the weed risk assessment is kind of like a nutrition label on some food. You know what you're gonna get. You know what's healthy, you know what's unhealthy. So we really hope people will choose a healthy option. Um, the weed risk assessment is non-regulatory. There are no laws surrounding it. So it's up to all of us to choose the right plant. And I think Franny showed this to you. Here is where you can find um, plant pono or the weed risk assessments. It's on plantpono.org. Pono means, you know, in balance, right? So Pono plants are the ones we would like people to grow. So you can click on plant assessment and then go to low risk plants. You can um, click right here. Whoops. I think Franny already gave a tour of the website. So if we have time in the end, I will um, do more. So let's look at some examples. Lantana. This is definitely one of the highest scoring invasive plants. Um, it's got thorns that 
creates dense thickets of thorny bushes. It puts um, poisons in the ground that prevent other plants from growing. It produces so many seeds that remain viable for many, many years. Um, there have been at least 20 biocontrols released to try to control lantana, all with little success. It's a fire hazard. It's toxic when consumed. And the seeds are actually spread by non-native fruit-eating birds, mostly. Um, croton is a low-risk plant. Um, it's not naturalized beyond its native range, which is a really good thing. Um, it doesn't have thorns, it doesn't make seeds, it's non-toxic, and it's well controlled by herbicides if that's what you need to do. Um, it's not a fire hazard, so it's a great plant. And it's got this green um, dial icon to let us know that it is Pono. Lufa is actually evaluate, even though we know lots about this plant. This one's kind of a, an outlier. It has a long history of cultivation. Um, it's not armed, so it has no thorns. It requires full sun to thrive, so that's a, a, a good thing. Um, it needs to be cross-pollinated, and if need be, um, it can be well-controlled by herbicides. So some of the invasive things about it is it has a smothering habit. It reaches reproductive maturity quickly. It's got relatives that are weedy, and it can establish in disturbed sites. It's just a plant you want to keep your eye on, not necessarily invasive. Autograph tree is high risk. Um, the sap and fruit are toxic. It's shade tolerant. It forms dense thickets. Um, seeds are dispersed by birds and humans. The Home Depot parking lot in Hilo and the Costco parking lot in Kona all have autograph tree growing as their parking lot tree. I mean, they could have chosen so many different plants. Um, and if you look at the Home Depot ones, they are sending down roots into the parking lot like a banyan tree. I, I just wonder how they're gonna handle that. And it's an epiphytic strangler. So birds eat the seeds and then they fly to other plants and excrete them. And then an, a new autograph tree can grow and the roots will coalesce with the parent tree and eventually strangle it and steal all the nutrients. I'm sure everybody has seen autograph tree growing out of people's gutters um, or on top of utility poles. Um, the walk to Shipman Beach, it used to be like pretty clear and open until you got to the forested part. And now it's all um, an autograph tree thicket that you have to walk through. So it's toxic, it produces many seeds, and it's very difficult to remove this tree. And yet it's still found in horticulture in Hawaii. Pineapple is a pono plant. Um, some pono traits are edible fruit. It doesn't produce seeds in Hawaii, and that's because we don't have pollinators. Back when people were importing any kind of non-native bird that they wanted to, there is actually a law saying you couldn't bring in hummingbirds because the pineapple industry was really important and you know making a lot of money. It was a major economic boom at the time. Um, so yeah, hummingbirds were never allowed to be imported to Hawaii. So our pineapples do not make seeds um, and they require full sun also. So I put this plant in, I was just gonna try to keep it easy, uh, even with Pono and um, invasive plants, but this is a vine. It's a Fabiaceae vine with three leaves and it's um, kind of got a smothering habit. It's called Vigna Jose. Doesn't really have a, a common name, but I am watching this spread all over Puna. It is so hard to remove. If you pull it up, um, any kind of root node that's still in the soil will still grow. And it reproduces by seeds that can reach reproductive maturity in six months. Um, this was introduced in the early 2000s. Um, it was documented as being invasive in about um, 2010. And now I just personally see it everywhere in Pune. I often hear, well, it's not invasive because it's useful to me. Well, it's not 
that's if it's useful to you does not mean it's um, invasive or not invasive. 90% of Hawaii's invasive plants were introduced on purpose because somebody found them to be useful or beautiful. Fountain grass was introduced in the early 1900s. There is a seed packet from about 1905 that says virtually maintenance free once established. <laughs> I mean, ain't that the truth? Um, Albizia, autograph tree, trailing tibicina, Wedelia and Myconia were all introduced for horticulture, forestry. Uh, none of these were for agriculture, but agriculture is another pathway of invasive species introductions. So why is Hawaii the invasive species capital of the world? Because we have no laws regarding the importation, sale, or cultivation of invasive plants. There are more than 250,000 flowering plants on earth, and you can import more than 99% of them, no questions asked. Um, besides that, I took this picture at a big box store, and we have you know, herbs and vegetables that were imported from the mainland. Why aren't we producing these here? Um, live plant introductions, importations, whether they're invasive or not, are one of the main pathways for other invasive species to reach Hawaii. Like the little fire ant, it arrived in the late 90s on a shipment of non-invasive palm trees from Florida. So life is all about choices. And since we know there are so many flowering plants, why, if the plant you like might be invasive, why not choose one that's non-invasive that has the same qualities? Like night blooming jasmine. It's an allergen. We get so many calls at bisque from neighbors and they're telling us that their allergies are so bad and that they have migraine headaches and it's because their neighbor has night blooming jasmine. There's nothing we can do to help them except to you know, ask the, the neighbor to not grow it. Um, anyways, it's got a lanky growth. I don't like the way night blooming jasmine looks personally and it spreads to neighboring properties. We all wanna be good neighbors. So why not choose Kwai Fa? It blooms year round. It's got a lovely scent. It's got a nice attractive um, growth habit. It's utility friendly, so it won't um, get into the power lines. It doesn't spread and it responds well to pruning. Also, it's really easy to propagate. You just cut it and stick it in the soil. Instead of alamanda. So if you've driven around Puna, um, even in Hilo, yellow alamanda, you can see that it's taking over places. And that is an interesting story because it's not invasive anywhere in the state, just Puna in, in South Hilo. Nobody knows why that is. But it's toxic to animals, it smothers other plants, um, it grows out of control, and it's biological pollution. If I saw my neighbor planting it, I would you know, of course, nicely ask them not to and explain why, because I don't need that landscaping nightmare to deal with that they planted. So why not choose Kuhio vine? Look at these beautiful flowers. They're so striking and it blooms year round and it's culturally significant. Prince Kuhio was traveling abroad and he was so taken by the beauty of this plant that he personally imported it to Hawaii. Uh, Metanilla, it forms dense thickets, it displaces native plants, um, it's shade tolerant, and again, it's biological pollution. We have a plant pono endorsed nursery in Hawaiian Acres, and he has one of the most diverse palm um, nurseries, maybe in the entire world, it's amazing. He loves these trees. He went deep into the jungle to collect them and bring them back to Hawaii. He's known each tree for over 20 years. They are his children. So when he sees one of his children with a metanilla growing on it, taking it out, you know, taking nutrients, it makes him so sad. And then he has to drag his ladder out and climb up the tree and take the um, metanilla off. So why not choose orange bromeliad? You know, if you like the epiphytic growth, it can grow on trees if you like it. It's got beautiful color and it's attractive to pollinators. 
So this is the invasion curve and it shows as time goes on and the species becomes more widespread, the cost of managing it goes up. So prevention, prevention is what we wanna do to combat invasive species. It's the cheapest, most cost-effective ways to you know, fight invasive plants. And we can do that by simply planting pono. So eradication, a lot of people call us at BISC. In fact, we just got a call today asking if we could control castor bean. And you know that tree, it's too widespread for us to eradicate. So usually um, the plants that we're going after to control and eradicate, you probably haven't seen them because they're not extremely widespread. Um, usually in the containment stage is when people notice it. So like European holly, we are controlling it in Hakalau Wildlife Refuge. We are trying to get it off the refuge and keep it from coming in. And then we have the management stage, and that's where we, you know, help the compute, uh, empower the community to control little fire ants on their own, or we teach them how to fight albizia. You know, when an invasive plant is too widespread, all you can do is live with it and manage it. Um, so pampas grass, this is, um, we're very proud to say at BISC, we eradicated it a few years ago. Um, it was pretty widespread on the big island, but not that many places. It was easy for us to see, um, easy for us to detect. And we were able to um, get the public to agree to let us come onto their property and remove the plant. So I often hear from people, well, I don't see it being invasive, so therefore it's not. But the thing is, is we spend countless hours surveying by roads, by drone, doing transects in the forest. We are looking for these invasive plants and, you know, mapping them. And then if we think we have a possibility of eradicating it, we go to our steering committee and, and we look at the possibilities and discuss it together. So I also hear, well, it's not invasive in my backyard. Well, your backyard is not a representation of what's going on in the forest and natural areas. Most backyards are pretty well maintained. When we're looking for new invasive plants, we're doing this in unmaintained yards, drainage ditches, roadsides, abandoned houses, and sometimes in the forest, because that's where these um, plants are going to start becoming invasive. So I also hear, but it's just one plant. One plant can't be harmful, right? Well, here we have a night blooming jasmine for sale at a store. And night blooming jasmine is one of the plants we're trying to convince the public to just stop buying. So the night blooming jasmine will bloom, maybe make your neighbors get migraines and hate you because they can't stand the smell. And then here we have it fruiting. So it's producing these white berry type fruits that have seeds in them. And guess what? It's very attractive to birds. So the non-native fruit eating birds, they eat it, they fly somewhere else and they excrete it out. So here we have some koa trees and up in front, we just have one little koa tree. I'm sorry, one little night blooming jasmine. I mean, it's just one night blooming jasmine growing in the koa forest. That's not bad, right? Well, we go down the road a little bit and it is an entire thicket of night blooming jasmine growing underneath the koa trees. So when these koa make seeds and the seeds fall down, they cannot germinate because they're choked out already by night blooming jasmine. There is no chance for natural regeneration in this koa forest. So when the koa die, all we're gonna have is a night blooming jasmine forest. And a monotypic stand of one plant does not um, recharge the aquifer. It does not hold in soil. It's just not good. Here is the, the plant pono page for night blooming jasmine. Um, I can see it's high risk. I can learn invasive characteristics in a little history. I see it's been cultivated in Hawaii since 1871. So again, prevention is what we wanna to do to combat invasive species. 
So our team has made this new document that's hot off the press to make it very, very easy for people to plant Pono. We created this document um, called Right Plant, Right Place, your go-to guide for non-invasive plant choices in East Hawaii. Um, and we've made these for, for different parts of the island as well. Um, if you wanna scan it, here's a link to the um, document or you know, we could share it with you as well. So we broke it up by you know, different types of plants. So we have fruit trees and natives. In each one, we explain how much water it needs, how much sun it needs, what kind of plant is it? Is it a tree or a shrub or what is it? And then how tall will it get? Um, we have ornamentals. So any kind of tea leaf is a pono plant. Um, this particular variety is called Miss Andrea. It's one of my favorite um, horticultural tea plants. Any kind of decina is good. Any kind of croton is good. Not every kind of heliconia, but this particular species is a pono plant. Um, and then we suggest some hedges like bird of paradise, Hawaiian white hibiscus, plumbago, natal plum, and fragrant flowers, because who doesn't love the smell of lovely flowers, but ones that aren't too overpowering? So pua kini kini, shampoo ginger, gardenia, and hoava, which is a native plant, are all great choices. Okay, I hope I didn't go too long. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. I can give a tour of plantpono.org if we have time, or if anybody has questions. Molly, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm going to just check really quick. There is a question in the chat from uh, Alyssa, but it says it's for me. She, well, I think this is when I was doing the, um, the, oh. the tour, so this could work. She's asking, how do you look up the status of something if you can't identify it? Um, so she has some weeds that she wasn't able to identify. So what would you recommend? How would she even start uh, if she has a plant in her backyard that's weedy? Yeah. And she's like, what is this? Where, where should she begin? You can always email us um, at biisc at hawaii.edu. We're happy to identify plants. I love a good challenge. Um, so there's that, that way, or there are certain apps that you could use. iNaturalist um, or PlantNet are two apps that work okay, but um, it's really hard here in Hawaii because the artificial intelligence hasn't been trained well enough for the tropics. So if you do one of those um, methods of identifying a plant, make sure and go and verify that that's a, the right species on um, reputable websites. That's great. And like you said, if, if you're really not finding it and you're really not trusting that, uh, that that app is giving you the correct ID, you can always email us here at BISC uh, or Facebook message us. We also uh, get a lot of Facebook messages or Instagram messages with pictures of plants and we can identify that for you. Um, and then Mary Beth is asking if it would be possible to put up the slide of the Pono plants again. I'm not sure which Pono plants. Is that uh, hopefully the... Whoops, sorry. <laughs> oh, do you... Okay, sorry. Okay. So, I mean, obviously that has how many thousands of plants in there at this point, Molly? How many yes. yeah. plants? So folks can actually go onto that website. Hey, go on there today. Drive Let's our check. Where does, where does poinsettia? Sorry, I, I see a question. Where does poinsettia fall? Ooh, that's a good question. Where does oh, poinsettia fall? It is Pono. You know, and there's something I want to add on to that for those, because I know we're we're coming up. I know it's hard to believe because it's still so warm, but we are coming up on poinsettia season and there are so many of these for sale. I think it's also important for us because these do grow in Hawaii and people do produce them. Maybe ask at your local nursery, like, are these imported or are they locally grown? Just, you Good. know, really want to yep. encourage our local 
growers, our horticultural growers here on yeah. the island, or at least in the state, so that we're not bringing as much stuff from out of state. So even if the plant itself is Pono, you know, you can always even take it up a notch and, and try to, you know, challenge yourself to focus more on purchasing plants that are grown locally. Yeah. Um, the Hawaii Community College always, or maybe it's UH, they usually have a great poinsettia sale every year. That's where I always get mine because supporting the university and, and young growers, I like to do it. Oh, that's, from lovely. that's where I'm going to get mine this year then too. I'll remind you. Wonderful. Okay, that is all that uh, we have in the questions. If anybody else has a question, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question, Verbally, we can do that. Uh, would anybody? I, I do. Sure. Um, I'm actually trying to develop a third of an acre as like a hula garden. Do you guys have like a list of actual indigenous plants? Why, yes, we do. Oh, can thank you. you. <laughs> can you still see my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. So you can go. I'll start from the beginning. Sorry. So go to plantpono.org and then you can click on find a Pono plant. Okay. And then right here, there's all these different ways to sort your plants. Oh, fun. You can choose native. Okay. And then I don't know if you're looking for lay flowers, you can oh, click. Oh, awesome. I see what you have there, Possum. I hadn't scrolled down. Perfect. That all these do. different ways to sort. So we want to make it as easy as possible. Exciting. Yeah. Because I'm trying to actually get rid of all the invasives on the third of an acre and make Good it job. strictly indigenous in, in Lower Puna. Good yeah. job. I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. So you'll probably be getting some identification plants. From okay. <laughs> my favorite, favorite part of my job. I love identifying oh. plants. Mahalo <laughs> I have a question if it's okay. We have yeah. first, thank you, Molly. Excellent oh, presentation. Thank you. Um, one, two questions. One okay. is I have a really bad, a couple bad plants on my property in Volcano and I'm not sure how to get rid of it. It's the false Ava that my husband- Oh gosh. Had. Yeah, I know. Oh. Molly shouldn't have said that on this. <laughs> it's so hard to get rid of it. I, I don't know what you can do. I know it's terrifying. So that was my one question is, oh. did website Sorry. put up you know different types of herbicides to use and the other was kind of maybe for franny how do we stop all the importing <laughs> i mean we're getting jacked at the airport to give up our oh my gosh G apple we bought at safeway that was shipped from new zealand and i don't know why they're letting all this come into our islands and polluting us and you know barraging us with this. So what do, is there any way? I, that is, that would have to be a, dis, a, a decision made at the state level, um, probably through the laws, probably through creating laws, because I don't think that the Department of Agriculture would voluntarily um, do that. I think that would have to be something that came down from the state legislature to the Department of Ag Agriculture to tell them to phase out imports, or at the very least phase out certain categories of imports. Um, and so I think people writing to their representatives at the state level, their state representatives or state uh, um, senators and saying, hey, this is something we're really concerned about. And we're seeing more and more invasive pests and more diseases arriving in Hawaii. And we know from a 20, uh, 2015 report by the US Forest Service that by far, the most important pathway for how things are accidentally getting here is live plant imports. That is the number one pathway. And so like knowing that and letting your your legislators know like, hey, this is something we would support that. And I think, you know, the outcome of that is we don't get as much things imported. And so people can't always find the things that, you know, they want this specific plant. But on the other hand, what we're doing is creating industry for the, those people here who want to grow and, and do, you know, beautiful things and not necessarily just native, but just beautiful non-invasive plants. And we could push that. Um, there hasn't been a lot of political willpower around that in the past, but I think we're seeing more and more people. So the more, the more that people can get sort of pushing that message out, you know, even to your friends, your neighbors, people in your gardening workshop group, you know, whatever, um, that we need to start stepping away from plant imports entirely. 
I think that's really going to come down to. Also, we know that it is not tourists and residents with the Fuji apple in their bag on the airplane that are bringing in invasive species. They did a study about it, and there were virtually no invasive species found by just you know randomly um, surveying airplane passengers. So I don't know. It seems like it must cost a lot of money. No, um, I was I just curious because when yeah. we're leaving the islands, they'll take our fruit away that we just bought to snack on the plane that we bought at Safeway. So yeah. why are they allowing plants to come in when yeah. they're going to take yeah. our away that we just purchased? In well, that case, you know. that's the right. If you notice, that's USDA. That's a federal uh, yeah, level of, of, yeah. of enforcement. And that is because large agricultural lobbies like in California and Texas are, are much more proactive in protecting their agriculture by saying, hey, we know that if this pest exists in this place, you are not allowed to bring in fresh thing. Mainly that's for fruit flies. You're not allowed to bring in fruit because they don't want these fruit flies that we have here in Hawaii. And so that's something that um, was put under a quarantine something like 30 years ago. We've been under a fruit fly quarantine for 30 years. It's usually only temporary. Hawaii is the only place that's had it forever. <laughs> Um, I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, you know, so what, and, and for things coming into the state, what you would need is a very powerful um, department of agriculture uh, at those same ports for things incoming saying, hey, we are also going to stand up for the things that are incoming to the state, but that would take money. And when you look at uh, how much money goes to Department of Agriculture, it's less than 1% of the state budget. So as important as agriculture is in the state of Hawaii, it's not actually, um, I think, reflected as a priority when you look at how the state budgets the money that that is coming in. Fascinating. Thank you, guys. Sure. I appreciate the information. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Yeah, and uh, somebody oh, asked if we could see code. the QR code again, if we could put up the, the QR code. Um, maybe he's answering some things there in the okay. chat. Are you getting to keep the week that does the poinsettia sale? So she's not sure if they're going to continue to do it. No, they, they do. I, sorry to say it like that. I go every year. Yes, the teacher um, retired, but they still do it. There's a new teacher. Wonderful. That's good. Yes. That's some, that's Molly, you can go to your presentation and. Um... Okay. Thank you, Kabegi. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's towards the end. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So can you, you can scan it right here with your phone and it'll go to the, um, the document. Okay, we went a little bit over the hour. I know some people had already jumped off because uh, we had that little technical difficulty earlier. But again, we put BISC at hawaii.edu, the email there in the chat. And um, we are so happy to take your questions anytime they pop up about plants. We're really invested in uh, the, the entire uh, planting world of the Big Island from sales to imports all the way down to what you're putting in your backyard or how to get rid of what's already in your backyard. We're, we're working on all of that. Um, we are working on, we have already a few plants that are most common and a lot of them are in Puna uh, that are weed trees or we're working on some brushy species right now. Uh, what are the best ways to go about treating those? So we do have that information on bisque.org, which is our BISC website. So if you um, are looking to try and get rid of something, you can go check that out. And we will continue to be adding to that. We're, we're testing, there are new herbicides that are on the market that are less, uh, they, they have less negative impacts than herbicides that are older. So, you know, we're really excited about new products that maybe have less impact on the environment that you can use. It's one and done. And from then on, you can plant Pono plants to keep the invasives out. So we have a lot of that that's coming up on our website. So just keep checking back in with us, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. And as we develop more things, we will be getting them out to you folks. So with that, I want to thank you, Molly for thank you with us today and thank you everyone who uh, was here and participated and and stuck with us during our little technical glitch i uh, really appreciate it Kavehi, thank you so much for uh, all your technical assistance and have a wonderful day everyone aloha